peering through an oppressive cloak of fog during the somber twilight hours of New York City in the year 1947, there looms an imposing spectre, the decaying Vanderbilt Triple Palace. Once a shining beacon of grandeur and prosperity, it now echoes with the hushed whispers of a forgotten splendor. In its heyday, the palace glistened like a diamond under the opulent glow of gaslit chandeliers. Rooms were decked with European art, while gilded mirrors reflected the refined tastes of the era's elite. The echoes of laughter, clinking crystal, and impassioned debates filled the grand halls, all bearing testimony to the meteoric rise of the Vanderbilt dynasty. However, the current visage of the Triple Palace was an unnerving contrast. Its decadent opulence had faded, traded for an ominous air of dereliction. The silent corridors now reeked of neglect and abandonment. The imposing structure that epitomized luxury now bore the scars of time and indifference, a granite edifice teetering on the brink of oblivion. Pondering such a heart-wrenching image, one might ask, how did this majestic empire collapse, surrendering its palatial grandeur to time's merciless grasp? Join us on this intriguing journey to answer your query as we embark on an expedition to once and for all explain how the Vanderbilt family went from old money to no money. The dawn of the 19th century unveiled a new titan in the American commercial narrative, a man by the name of Cornelius Vanderbilt, affectionately known as the Commodore. His tale opens in the rugged setting of Staten Island, New York in 1794. Birthed fourth in a lineage of nine, young Cornelius was cast in the forge of humility, born into an environment of limited means. Looking back through history, the seeds of the Vanderbilt legacy can be traced to De Bilt, nestled in the heart of Utrecht, Netherlands. Here, Jan Ertsen, Cornelius's great-great-great-grandfather and a humble Dutch farmer, sought a new life in New Amsterdam, the city that would eventually bear the name New York. In an amazing twist of fate, this ancestor of one of America's wealthiest dynasties came to the New World not only penniless, but was forced into indentured servitude upon his arrival in 1650. However, his backbreaking work would turn out to be the sacrifice that set the Vanderbilt legacy in motion. His village name, suffixed by the Dutch Vander, translated to of the built, eventually morphed over generations into the weighty name of Vanderbilt. Now the inception of Cornelius's empire was marked at the tender age of 16, as he gambled on a ferry service operation between Staten Island and Manhattan, funded by a loan of $100 from his mother. This modest venture bloomed into a colossal fortune exceeding $100 million, a staggering sum that today's standards would value over $200 billion. Cornelius Vanderbilt, a figure cast in the mold of determination and intelligence, etched his path to prosperity through an inexhaustible work ethic and shrewd business maneuvering. His simple ferry service expanded its reach during the tumultuous times of the War of 1812, serving the far-flung government outposts strewn around New York City. As peace was restored, Vanderbilt shifted his sights to the steamship industry, aligning himself with the strategic acumen of Thomas Gibbons. Possessing an innate radar for identifying opportunities within fledgling markets, Vanderbilt seized control of the steamboat and nascent railroad industries, effectively transforming the American landscape. In particular, his strategic mastery lay in his ability to grow markets, outmaneuvering competition through offering accessible prices and exploring untapped territories. He built his businesses on the burgeoning pillars of customer satisfaction, efficiency, frugality, and uncompromising consequences for dishonesty or idleness. And even better, this agile titan was no stranger to industry evolution. His adaptability became evident when he smoothly transitioned from steamboats to railroads. Not merely content with business savvy, Vanderbilt was also a ruthless competitor, infamous for his aggressive tactics in obliterating competition. And with regard to his temperament, as a man of few words, Vanderbilt was esteemed for his impeccable judgment of character. He often remained stoic in the face of criticism, steadfast in his decisions, his unyielding determination and adaptability. This drive allowed him to amass a formidable fortune, crowning him as one of the wealthiest Americans of the 19th century. In fact, his lifestyle could be described as having an even Spartan-like frugality, a trait inherited from his mother. This very deliberate lifestyle choice marked him as an outlier creating a tangible rift between himself and the glittering upper echelons of high society. Yet, unbeknownst to the Commodore, a dramatic shift loomed on the horizon. His descendants, heirs to the Vanderbilt fortune, 
would cast away their patriarch's doctrine of frugality. They instead embraced a life dripping with extravagance and opulence, casting aside the lessons of their forebear and eventually, as the kids today would say, fumbling the bag. You see, their actions would signal a stark departure from Cornelius's principles, setting the stage for a story of epic downfall and squandered wealth. A tale as grand as their inheritance, filled with missteps, excesses and lavish spending that would threaten the very existence of the Vanderbilt fortune. With the arsenal of family lineage and robust wealth at their disposal, one could imagine the Vanderbilts flourishing as an enduring emblem of American old money. Yet, in an unexpected twist of fate, Cornelius Vanderbilt's descendants took a nosedive into the realms of opulence and luxurious excess. The precursor to this ill-fated journey was William Henry Vanderbilt, Cornelius's son. Despite his pedigree, he failed to instill the old money ethos into his eight offspring, arguably raising several who were, alas, spoiled brats beyond measure. In his personal life, William managed to amass an estate worth $200 million by the time of his demise in 1885, doubling his father's empire. However, whispers of his volatile temperament and emotional inconsistency cast a shadow over his accomplishments, and likely hint at how he would come to raise a generation of intemperate progeny. Early anecdotes recount tales reminiscent of HBO's succession, portraying the relationship between William and his father, Cornelius, akin to that of Logan Roy and Kendall Roy. Cornelius, often frustrated with his eldest son, called him a blockhead and blatherskite. William yearned to prove otherwise, but lacked the courage to face the Commodore's censure. However, a turning point arrived during a family voyage to Europe aboard the steamship Vanderbilt in 1860. Following this trip, father and son grew closer, and William assumed an increasingly integral role in the Vanderbilt business empire. Yet, once at the helm, William's unpredictable nature became a public nuisance. One incident in particular occurred in 1883, when journalist John Dickinson Sherman questioned him about his operation of the Limited Express train service. One incident in particular occurred in 1883. To a question about whether the trains were run for public convenience, William retorted, the public be damned. This outburst reflected the growing detachment of the Vanderbilt lineage from the principles of their patriarch. Upon the demise of William Henry Vanderbilt, the family's financial leviathan passed into the hands of his sons, Cornelius Vanderbilt II and William Kissam Vanderbilt. This heralded a new era in the dynasty's narrative, one marked by an increasingly convoluted distribution of wealth. The vast Vanderbilt fortune, once a concentrated reservoir of wealth, began to spread thin across an ever-growing family tree. With each passing generation, the inheritance split among a growing number of descendants. As family branches multiplied, the division of assets exacerbated, gradually diluting the individual shares of the once enormous family wealth. Simultaneously, the formidable grasp of inheritance taxes began to gnaw at the edges of the family's fortune. As one generation passed and handed down their wealth to the next, each transfer was met with sizable tax implications. Over time, these seemingly harmless nibbles transformed into significant bites out of the family coffers. The shadow of such financial burdens grew longer with each subsequent generation, steadily eroding the formidable Vanderbilt fortune. Worse still, the family was plagued by a series of reckless financial choices. Much of the Vanderbilt progeny, far removed from the industrious ethos of their forebear, failed to demonstrate the same business acumen and financial prudence that Cornelius Vanderbilt had once embodied. High-risk ventures, failed investments, and a lack of interest in nurturing the family's business interests dealt a series of devastating blows to their wealth. Compounding this was their inclination towards a luxurious lifestyle. Unlike the Commodore, the descendants reveled in extravagance and opulence. They spent prodigiously, indulging in grand mansions, ostentatious parties and lavish art collections. Such unrestrained spending only served to accelerate the decline of the once mighty Vanderbilt fortune. This combination of expanding family size, punishing inheritance taxes, imprudent financial decisions and unabated spending cast a foreboding shadow over the Vanderbilt dynasty. The fortune, once a titan in the annals of American wealth, gradually began its descent into oblivion. By the mid-20th century, the Vanderbilt star had considerably dimmed in the American public sphere, as evidenced by the fate of their grand Fifth Avenue mansions, many of which were sold, demolished or repurposed as museums. 
A mere 30 years post Cornelius Vanderbilt's death, not a single Vanderbilt was listed among the wealthiest Americans. Tragically, within half a century of the Commodore's passing, the vast Vanderbilt fortune had entirely evaporated. Now, let us delve deeper into the distinctive factors that precipitated the decline of the Vanderbilt wealth and juxtapose it with a family that, despite amassing wealth during the same era, managed to sustain it through generations. To understand the contrasts, let's first consider a hypothetical scenario. Imagine a dominant figure at the helm of a multi-billion dollar family empire suddenly succumbing to illness. The CEO, who doesn't belong to the family, has handpicked a COO as his successor. Yet the board remains divided in its support. The company's financial health is waning, prompting board anxieties. Without the board's unanimous backing, exploring alternative CEO candidates becomes imperative. Further convoluting matters is the Greenhorn board chair, a family member with another family member and controlling shareholder expecting this chair to ascend as the next CEO. This scenario may seem unusual, but in the world of family-owned businesses, finding a successor is a complex labyrinth. The Vanderbilt family's story mirrors this scenario. The dispersion of their fortune during the third generation corresponded with diminishing family interest in their key asset, the New York Central, coupled with escalating expenses. The Vanderbilts were known for their philanthropy, especially William Keesom Vanderbilt of the third generation, who donated millions to numerous causes. Yet, the dawn of income and estate taxes and the family's incessant spending hastened their wealth's decline. During the initial stages of their wealth accumulation, there was a minimal business regulatory framework, allowing them a free hand in dominating entire industries. The era they thrived in was marked by an absence of income and estate taxes, which meant that the Vanderbilts were able to amass an unimaginable fortune free of governmental restrictions or financial drains. However, as societal norms and governmental policies evolved, the Vanderbilts found themselves facing new challenges. This era also saw an increased regulatory focus on monopolies and business practices, adding another layer of complexity to maintaining and growing their fortune. Further exacerbating this situation was the Great Depression, which wreaked havoc on the American economy. It affected the Vanderbilt's investments and economic interests, leading to a significant downturn in their fortunes. The Rockefeller family, conversely, employed shrewd strategies to safeguard their wealth. John D. Rockefeller's business, via generation-skipping trusts, ensured wealth propagation through the generations. A generation-skipping trust allows the transfer of substantial amounts of money tax-free, skipping a generation, usually passing from the grantor to the grandchildren, rather than the children. In the Rockefellers' case, they managed to retain and multiply their wealth by channeling it down to more distant generations, rather than distributing it among immediate successors. Now, if you'd like to hear more specifics about the Rockefeller family's rags-to-riches story, be sure to click the video on the right-hand corner of the screen, or visit the video description box below to hear our deep dive on that dynasty's fascinating tale. The Vanderbilts, however, after a few generations, lacked an established core business that could continuously feed wealth into their trust. Their approach primarily involved the passing of assets directly from parent to child in each generation. This strategy not only exposed their wealth to the successive imposition of estate taxes with each generational transfer, but also made their fortune vulnerable to the lavish spending habits of each inheritor. The Rockefellers, by structuring their wealth transfer through a generation-skipping trust, managed to avoid these pitfalls and ensure the long-term preservation of their family's wealth. And what else set the Rockefellers apart? David Rockefeller Jr., chairman of Rockefeller & Company in a rare interview, spoke of a system of values, traditions and institutions developed by the family. These mechanisms aided the family in staying united and preserving their wealth, serving as practical tools for any family trying to instill sound monetary values in their children. Remarkably, the Rockefeller family largely remained unified, devoid of public scandals, feuds, lawsuits or tragedies that typically plague wealthy dynasties. Today, over 250 direct descendants of John D. Rockefeller and Laura Spellman Rockefeller form the family. We meet as a family twice a year, often more than 100 of us in a room for a Christmas lunch, for example, said David Rockefeller. From the age of 21, family members are invited to these gatherings, aptly called the Family Forum. Here they discuss the family's direction, 
new members, career news and other significant milestones. They ensure everyone feels part of the family including those who married into it. Preserving the family history is also deemed essential. The Rockefellers do this through their familial homesteads, places passed down over generations where they can reconnect with their past. I can go back to the place where my great-grandfather lived over 100 years ago and see how he lived and see how his son and their grandchildren lived," added David Rockefeller. Such practices exemplify the different approaches two similarly wealthy families took to wealth preservation. The Vanderbilt legacy today is a fascinating tale of resilience, adaptation, and lessons learned from the rise and fall of one of America's wealthiest families. Despite the family's difficulties and the decline of their once vast fortune, some members of the Vanderbilt family have managed to create their own paths and leave lasting impressions on society. Gloria Vanderbilt, a descendant of the Vanderbilt family, faced a difficult life marked by personal tragedies and challenges. Born in 1924, she was the daughter of Reginald Claypool Vanderbilt and Gloria Morgan Vanderbilt. At a young age, Gloria was thrust into the spotlight during a highly publicized custody battle between her mother and her paternal aunt, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. Despite these early hardships, Gloria went on to become a highly respected and successful artist, fashion designer, and author. Her resilience and determination to forge her own path endeared her to the public and made her a beloved figure. Throughout her life, Gloria Vanderbilt was not only a colorful, but also a very successful personality who made many contributions to the society in which she lived and thrived. She was an exceptional, vivacious fashion icon, renowned for her distinctive style and the widely successful Vanderbilt's brand. In a fascinating aside, one of our followers at Old Money Luxury shared a personal interaction with Gloria Vanderbilt, recalling, I met Gloria Vanderbilt at her New York art show in 2003. She was elegant, well-bred, polite, soft-spoken, and greeted me with a big smile on her face. Her hair, makeup, clothes were impeccable and understated. Her teeth and complexion were perfect. I'm so glad I met her, I've read her books. She lived appropriately. She was an iconic figure who needed protection from devious people. At her level of wealth, she had friendships with designers, actors, singers, lawyers, professors, business people with education and talent. She loved her sons deeply. Gloria's sons, Anderson Cooper and Carter Vanderbilt Cooper, also faced their share of challenges growing up as Vanderbilt descendants. Anderson Cooper, a well-known journalist and television personality, has spoken openly about the impact of his family's history on his life and career. He has expressed gratitude for the opportunities his family's legacy has afforded him, while also acknowledging the importance of hard work and self-reliance. Tragically, Carter Vanderbilt Cooper passed by his own hand at the age of 23, a devastating loss for the family. The current financial situation of the Vanderbilt descendants varies, as the once enormous family fortune has been significantly diminished over the years. Many of the family's descendants have pursued careers in various fields, from journalism to fashion, and have built their own wealth and success independent of the family's legacy. The family's remaining assets and lingering influence can still be seen in the form of their historic mansions, such as the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina, and the Breakers in Newport, Rhode Island. These properties serve as reminders of the family's immense wealth and influence during the Gilded Age and continue to attract visitors from around the world. The rise and fall of the Vanderbilts offers valuable lessons for future generations. The importance of responsible wealth management, strategic estate planning, and the potential pitfalls of excessive spending and poor investment decisions are all evident in the family's story. Additionally, the Vanderbilt legacy serves as a reminder of the importance of resilience and adaptability in the face of adversity. And now, we'd love to see you in the comments. Do you think history has been kind to the Vanderbilts or too harsh? What are your opinions on their legacy? Let us know below. And as always, thank you for your continued viewership with us here at Old Money Luxury.